dear friends and supporters, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. My name is Xiaohua Yang. I'm a director of the Center for Business Studies and Innovation in Asia Pacific, or called CBSI, and professor of international business at the University of San Francisco. On behalf of the organizing committee, I warmly welcome you to our first joint webinar, Unicorn Strategies in Southeast Asia, Implications for the U.S. and Asian Collaborative Innovation. This webinar is co-hosted by University of San Francisco, the Center for Business Studies and Innovation in Asia Pacific, Georgia Tech's Center for International Business Education and the Research. We want to thank all the co-sponsors supporting our events, M. Chen, Singapore, Asian Academy of Manage Management, Bay Area Council Economic Institute, Enterprise Singapore, Global USF Business Forum, Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, Singapore Global Network, Universita Indonesia, Universita de San Andres. Uh, may I introduce my wonderful team members? John McIntyre, Professor of Strategy and Innovation, Executive Director, Georgia Tech Center for International Business Education and Research. Raja Cheng, Professor, Professor of Innovation Office. Strategy at the University of San Francisco, Chair of Asia Business Leaders, Leaders Research Program at the CBSI. James Howdy. Howdy, Associate Director, Georgia Tech Center for International Business Education and Research. The re-emergence of Southeast Asia as regional power epicenter for innovation is well known. This region boasts a GDP of about 3.2 trillion, making it the fifth largest economy in the world and a population of 655 million, which could be the third largest country. By all accounts, the region is fast becoming a global innovation hub. And the region has recently given rise to many unicorns, outcompeting many other countries and regions. To address this new unicorn phenomenon, we have gathered a group of world's leading scholars and experts and unicorn founders to discuss what we already know and what we do not know about unicorns in Southeast Asia. And what has made it possible for startups in this region to achieve this high level of success in such a short a period of time. This, this webinar, webinar will not only share inspiring startup stories, but also discuss practical and theoretical frameworks to predict future trends and explore partnership opportunities for technology high-tech companies in the US and Southeast Asia. And I'm also excited to share um, 31 countries representing six uh, Continents um, uh, actually are here, uh, you know, um, we, with over 300 people registered for this webinar. And it is now my privilege to introduce the Reverend Paul Fitzgerald, uh, Society of Jesus, the 28th president of University of San Francisco. I was fortunate to be part of the USF delegation, Father Paul, led to Asia in June this year and saw what was unfolding with our own eyes. Father Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, <clears throat> Professor Yang. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. I wanna thank our partners, especially at uh, Georgia Tech for organizing this. Um, the University of San Francisco, as you can probably guess, is a Jesuit uh, university uh, founded in 1855. Uh, and for more than 100 years, we have been educating uh, young people from Asia, uh, some of whom settle in the United States and, and many of whom return. We currently have 6,000 alumni in Asia. Uh, and to give you just a few names, uh, Agnes Shen. Agnes Shen 
vice president of Trinity Limited, um, a whole chain of luxury men's clothing stores across Southern China. Uh, Mr. Wei Jin Shan living in Hong Kong, also president of PAG. And if you really want to read a wonderful story, uh, read his recent memoir, Out of the Gobi, and you'll see it is a rags to riches story. Uh, Cindy, uh -huh. Yung, Cindy Yung and her two sisters came to USF. Uh, while they were here, their father's business didn't do well. So when they returned to Hong Kong, they turned the em Emperor Watch Group into one of the largest uh, jewelry empires uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, Oisin Chung is now global chairman of the Hyundai Motor Group. Uh, he was here with us for his master's in business administration. I had the pleasure of meeting with him and seeing the innovation labs at Hyundai, and it is nothing less than remarkable. Uh, Mr. Arthur Tay in Singapore, he is the CEO of the SUTL Group, and uh, just a terrific example of an entrepreneur who gives back to society in so many ways. Uh, in Bangkok, Mr. Tirapong Chansiri of the uh, Thai Union Seafood Group, and you know, working very hard for uh, sustainable uh, seafood supplies, uh, humane uh, working conditions, and giving back to society in so many other ways. And then uh, last but certainly not least, I, I can't help but mention uh, Mr. Putra Masagung, uh, the uh, graduate school at the University of San Francisco is the Masagung School of Management. And Putra is one of our most successful alumni. Um, and uh, just these folks represent sort of our more mature alums who are building bridges across the Pacific Ocean and, and to Europe and South America, uh, tying the world together through trade and commerce uh, and looking for that peaceful coexistence and that harmonious coexistence uh, that is the promise of the future. Uh, the University of San Francisco has many, many younger alumni, uh, many of whom are just now founding companies, starting up their hoped for unicorns. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we expect and hope and yeah. believe that they will do so with creativity, imagination, ethics, and integrity. Uh, these are the folks whose handshake is as good as a signature on a contract. So again, welcome to this webinar. Uh, you know, a peaceful trade around the world, uh, looking for sustainability, environmental sustainability, and friendship among peoples. Uh, this is our best hope. And that is really the purpose of the, the University of San Francisco, uh, you know, for all our degree programs. Uh, we want students who graduate and then change the world uh, for the better. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father Paul, for your warm welcome to our audience and our speakers and for your inspiring stories. And now it's, um, uh, it's time for me to turn it over to my colleague, Professor John McIntyre, who will moderate the first panel. John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Father Paul, for these inspiring words. Uh, let me mention before I get going that we at Georgia Tech hope we'll have plenty of opportunities to work more closely with the University of San Francisco, particularly as we focus on uh, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia. We do a lot of work on China and India, but we're convinced that uh, Southeast Asia is indeed the ASEAN nation are indeed the way to go for the United States. Uh, uh, Chao Wa, you mentioned uh, some very basic statistics. I want to remind our audience that US goods and services trade with ASEAN countries, all 10 ASEAN countries, total more than a $370 billion uh, dollars in 2020. Uh, it's an important area of the world. It will be increasingly so for the United States. And it's against that background that uh, I welcome you to the first panel, which is designed as a more academic, theoretical, somewhat panel. And we have arrayed four distinguished scholars, researchers, practitioners of the field in looking at uh, technology entrepreneurship uh, in Asia, more specifically, but also more generically in emerging economies. It's my pleasure to introduce to you in the order of their presentation, uh, Diego Finkelstein, Professor Sri Adiningshi, uh, uh, Dr. Hamad Gamal, 
and uh, Professor uh, Stefan Zhang. So let me say a few very short words. Uh, Diego is a professor at the Universidad de San Andres in Argentina. He's a researcher at the Consejo Nacional de Investigación Científicas y Técnicas of Argentina, CONICET, has a PhD from uh, uh, Northwestern, and his main areas of expertise relate to state action and internationalization, innovation from emerging market. Uh, he is also the executive director of the Emerging Multinationals Research Network. I've read some of his stuff and he's right on target. And it's uh, great to have a young scholar uh, ready and willing to participate. Uh, you'll see his PowerPoint is excellent. Uh, I don't want to, to, to burn any of your bridges and remove a head of steam from you. Uh, I know you have to leave right at the end of that particular panel because you are going to uh, Uruguay, probably across the Rio Plata uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, we look forward to your presentation. Next is Professor Dr. Sri Adiningshi, who is a distinguished economist and a well-known professor at the Faculty of Economic and Business Universitas Gadjamada. Uh, she is a member of the Indonesia Academy of Science, AIPI, founder of the Institute of Social, Economic and Digital, ISED. She received her master's and doctorate at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She has also had various roles. She's very connected to the economic environment and the institutional environment. Commissioner of Indosat Uredo, chairperson of the President Advisory Council of the Republic of Indonesia, it's really a pleasure to have her. I was looking at some of your publications, and I hope uh, we get a chance to work with you later at the end of this uh, program and seek your counsel and advice. Uh, third presenter is a younger scholar, uh, Dr. Ahmad Gamal, who currently serves as the Director of Innovation and Science Technopark at Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta, where he's also a professor. Uh, DS, uh, DISTP, that's the abbreviation, is Universitas Indonesia Technology Transfer Office and Business Incubator. He has a very uh, compelling presentations for us with a lot of information, which we look forward to, being, to, uh, to, to hearing. And last but not least, uh, a colleague, uh, at uh, Adelaide University in Southern Australia, uh, Professor Stephen Zhang, who is a professor specialized in entrepreneurship with a focus on Asia. Uh, he has taught previously at the University of Sydney, Catholic University of Chile, National University of Singapore. He is also a founder of startups, received his graduate education at the National University of Singapore and uh, has been involved in several industries, including engineering, management, consultancy. So without further ado, we have about one hour and 17 minutes uh, to the end of the first panel. I'll turn it over to Diego. Diego, you have a presentation with slides. I think James and you have agreed on the modus operandi. The floor is yours. And thank you again for joining us. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, and thanks to everyone. I'm, I'm really excited about Participating in this panel are also honored to be invited with so important figures in here. So anyway, uh, without uh, much further ado, I, I'll start with my presentation. Let me share the screen first. I'm gonna be sharing my screen. Uh, so I'm gonna give more like a overall generic perspective, uh, highlighting some conceptual tools and giving some data on, on the rise of uh, unicorns in emerging markets. Okay, so first, I would like to start with the uh, with the most with the most obvious things, right? What are unicorns, and why should we care about them, right? Um, well, um, in that sense, uh, I'll first start with some empirics about it, like what is going on with unicorns around the world, and especially in emerging markets, right? Uh, what are they? Well, th these are uh, entrepreneurial ventures that have grown very fast and uh, they have reached the, the milestone of uh, having a market capitalization uh, of at least $1 billion in less than 10 years. And they are uh, 
they are of course related to tech. Uh, they are they're in tech related uh, activities. Okay, uh, just to give you a few figures or, or some things that, in a way, uh, put in perspective the the amazing growth of unicorns that we have had in the last few years. Uh, in two in 2014, the Wall Street uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, Journal accounted for 82 82 unicorns around the world. Just a few years, about eight years later. CB8, CB, CB Insights accounts for more than 1,100 unicorns over the world. So it has, I mean, the, the, the growth of tech companies that have grown rapidly and became like really big companies with a market cap over a billion dollars has been tremendous, right? Um, of course, of course, most of these unicorns come from developed countries, which they have more resources to do so, right? They have uh, general, generally speaking, they have more access to capital, they have more access to technology, to knowledge, and that's why most of the unicorns come from uh, from developed countries, right, from advanced economies. However, of course, the, the, uh, the exception of this is China, which is huge, right, I don't have to tell you about it, uh, and just, just, by, just by themselves, the U.S. and China uh, are, are about approximately uh, seventy percent of the the unicorns that we can find in twenty twenty two, right? So again, uh, the the uh, there and and especially from the US, right? We have a uh, a little bit more than one hundred and seventy unicorns from China and about um, six hundred and eighty from the US, more or less, right? Um, but I think that what interest is more what is more of our interest here is that. This, despite the fact that, again, most unicorns come from developed countries, we have been a very interesting growth, rapid and intense growth of unicorns that are not, uh, do not come from these sort of countries, but rather they are born uh, uh, and, and they grow in emerging markets, right? So uh, from their empirical perspective, we should care because it's actually happening, right? And we have seen a, a very um, large growth of unicorns from these from emerging uh, emerging market areas, right? This is just to give you a perspective. Uh, where are these unicorns coming from? Where are the, the unicorns from emerging markets coming from? Uh, and, and of course, there, there seems to be a correlation between the, 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 the size of the country, the size of the economy. You can see Brazil, India, China as the one with more representative uh, with the amount of unicorns that they have. And uh, and of course the the key role of China um, in this in this uh, in here right. Uh, but I also wanted to focus on why should we care from maybe a developmental perspective, right? Um, and by developmental perspective, I mean what can they contribute contribute to the society of emerging markets, right? I mean in which way we as citizens should care about them, in which way they can contribute to the overall wealth, uh, growth, or development of these um, of, of the countries in which these unicorns uh, emerge, right? Um, first thing and most obvious thing to, the, to uh, thing to say is that they come from uh, they they are by nature because the definition of, of a unicorn implies being in tech related activities, so uh, they are usually. Uh, they usually focus in activities with high added value, right? Which is something that uh, emerging market markets seek for, but at the same time they frequently lack, right? So having these uh, these uh, in a way pioneers of companies that grow rapidly in, in activities that create more added value, it's I believe it's something positive uh, out of this uh, out of the unicorns, right? Uh, another interesting thing, also related to, to the, the, their own definition, is that, again, these companies grow really fast, right? And in that sense, they can do, they, they can expand through leapfrogging, right? I mean, because they grow so fast and they reach to the 1 billion milestone so fast, they, it's, it's not like a gradual organic growth, but rather like a very rapid one. And this, this could very important be very important because, I mean, uh, emerging markets are always trying to catch up 
with developed countries, right? With advanced economies. So these companies that in a way catch up with the, with the rest of the companies in the world in a most rapid way, also bring hope um, and expectation in, in regards to how these countries can, can move forward in the, in the catching up process and eventually becoming uh, advanced economies or developed economies, right? Uh, another interesting thing is that, and I'll talk uh, in, in a few minutes about it with more detail, is that these companies usually appear in sectors that there are some kind of gaps, right? Especially in emerging markets, right? They, 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 in a way, they try to solve some uh, structural problems and gaps existing in emerging markets, right? Given their institutional, economic, and social uh, characteristics, right? And in that way, given that the, they try to solve this problem, right? They may create a solution related to the uh, economic or social gaps. And in here, maybe fintechs uh, could be uh, a good example of this, right? Usually, fintech companies um, kind of, uh, especially in emerging markets, in a way uh, are able to introduce people that were initially excluded from the financial sector into, into the economy. And I've seen so many fintechs using, you know, as a sales pitch, uh, talking about that they come to democratize the, the, the finances of the world, right? So in that sense, uh, what do they mean by democratizing finance, uh, the financial sector? Well, giving tools to people that have been traditionally excluded uh, from the financial system, uh, giving them tools to participate on them, right? So in that sense, they are solving a problem that is, uh, that is uh, is present in emerging uh, economies, right? EdTechs also, in a way, try to solve also, uh, all these education problems, right? And, and we have many of these uh, companies trying to fill these gaps, right? Trying to solve, uh, trying to solve these market failures that are not existent or are less uh, less important uh, in, in developed countries, but they are they become. Uh, Sometimes they become a structural problem in in, in emerging in emerging markets, right? Um, additionally, they create they may create spillover effects and reinforcing effects uh, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, of the countries in which they are, right? What do I mean by this? Well, spillover effect would be, I mean, these unicorns are in tech related activities, so they seek if they are able. If you find many and they grow so fast, they they'll probably demand for. Uh, a greater, a greater uh, amount of qualified jobs, right? But it's not only about qualified jobs, right? Given if these companies are successful, then they may create a, a, a better environment uh, for, uh, for the country, for, uh, for the entrepreneurial ecosystem in these countries. So this may create, given that these companies have been su uh, successful, then uh, further capital may be more confident on what is going on in, the, in this particular entrepreneurial ecosystem, and they may bring more funding opportunities given the success of their predecessors, right? Of the, of the current unicorns, right? Um, also, uh, the, 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 especially the pioneers also set the example for the unicorns to, uh, that, the, the potential unicorns, right? So in that sense, it increases the entrepreneurial spirit, but also it increases the, the entrepreneurial network because usually what you find in emerging markets, and if you talk with uh, many entrepreneurs, the, most of them uh, acknowledge and put a, a, as a positive thing, the fact that the, the, color, the, the collaborative nature of the entrepreneurial ecosystems, you know, uh, of the entrepreneur, entrepreneur network uh, of these countries, right? So the, the more you have, the more collaboration, the more opportunity to share the knowledge with, with the smaller entrepreneurs and then uh, a positive circle may, may, may be created, right? So uh, from, the, from, a develop, from a development perspective, I think that there are many features of unicorns um, that uh, may, may or should, uh, should encourage, the, encourage us to pay attention 
to this particular phenomenon, right? Especially in emerging markets, okay? So um, what are the differences then? What are the, and here I'll just briefly mention a few, right? What are the differences between advanced, uh, unicorns from advanced economies and the one from emerging markets, right? Um, so perhaps the, uh, the, the first and most important uniqueness is the actual existence of uh, or appearance of unicorns in emerging markets. Why do I say this? Well, because usually when you think in emerging markets, they are usually, as I said at the beginning, they, uh, they are having uh, challenges in terms of uh, capital availability. Of course, they do not have the level of knowledge and technology existing in, uh, in advanced economies. So despite all these challenges that these teams can actually emerge, it's, it's a unique feature by itself, I think, right? Uh, and, um, and actually these, these challenges that I've just mentioned, I think that also uh, shape the way unicorns, uh, shape the way unicorns evolve in emerging markets. Uh, first of all, it, it, given that they have a first mover advantage, right? Usually in many cases, multinationals are reluctant to initially enter these markets, right? And this gives space for local companies to, uh, to do some activities, right? And maybe some activities that were originally uh, done in, a, in, a, in emerging markets, sorry, in advanced economies, then, uh, then local companies replicate them in their own markets, but it's not just a copycat replication. It's a replication with adaptation to the particular needs of this country, right? And this happens a lot on e-commerce. If you take a look on, on e-commerce in most emerging areas, you don't have an Amazon, right? Uh, dominating the market, right? I mean, you have Alibaba in, in, in China, uh, you have Flipkart, you have uh, Mercado Libre in, in, in Latin America. So again, uh, you have local companies that have used the model that originally appeared in the States, but they adapted to the particular needs of, uh, of their own countries, right? Uh, and in this sense, they could do it with more space because uh, multinational companies from advanced uh, economies were initially reluctant to enter into these countries, right? Also another thing, another interesting concept is related to the to tropicalized innovation. Um, by tropicalized innovation, I mean taking advantage of the particular uh, institutional, uh, of the particular institutional uh, voids existing in these countries, right? To create things that wouldn't appear in other countries because these uh, in, in advanced economies because these actual uh, institutional voids are not present, right? So create innovation that is more likely to appear in this country. And the fact that it's more likely to appear in this country doesn't necessarily mean that it only applies to these countries, right? Uh, it could eventually apply even for advanced economies, okay? Um, from my, also, I wanted to give some empirical data in here. If you take a look on advanced economies uh, and wh where are the unicorns placed, these are the five uh, most important sectors in which you can find unicorns in 2022, right? And these are the ones from emerging markets, right? And you, you might see, I mean, first of all, I, the first conclusion that I take out of this is that uh, overall, overall, uh, advanced economies have unicorns in, in sectors that are more at the vanguard, right? Like um, AI, cybersecurity, software, right? It is important that these sectors are still present in, in, in emerging markets, but uh, at a lower level, right? At, with a, with a not such, such an intense presence, right? And you can also see, also very interesting, that e-commerce very important, right? Uh, this might be the original unicorn from uh, advanced economies, but nowadays are, are not are not the most important ones, right? Probably because they have already passed these ten years and they are they are no longer unicorns. But in emerging markets, e-commerce is really really important, right? 
Um, so anyway, that's something also to consider. I also wanted to show you a little bit about the amount of unicorns that you could find by region, right? And in here, I, I, sep I uh, separated China from the rest of Asia just to give a better perspective. And you can see that China by itself has more unicorns than any other region. Then it's uh, closely followed by the rest of Asia and then very far away, Latin America, and even, in, even at the lower level, you have Africa. Uh, but I also wanted to share with you within these regions in uh, which activities do, do you find uh, these unicorns, right? And here you have it, right? Like the two top activities by, um, by region, right? And what you could see is that except from China, like in all of these countries, the, sorry, in all of these regions, both e-commerce and fintech are the, are the activities in which you could find more unicorns, okay? Uh, in China, it's, uh, um, it's uh, e-commerce and AI. And I put in there also AI just to give you a perspective on what is going on with AI in, in the other region, right? Even and comparing Asia with Latin America and Africa, for instance, what you could see is that, uh, first of all, you have more activities. I only show three for, for a matter of simplicity in here, but you can see that the two most important ones in, in Asia are about 40%, while in Africa, the two most important ones are 80% and in, uh, in Latin America are 60%. Right, so you have a, a greater diversity of sectors uh, in Asia, and uh, another inter interesting thing is that um, that some of these are more important than others in in um, in these countries, right? Um, so um, I also wanted to. So what what are some key characteristics of unicorns from emerging markets? Okay, and uh, here I have a few. Okay, um, first of all, they, they are mainly based in consumer needs rather than focusing. You do have some companies, uh, companies focusing like super really high tech things like AIs or even software or some other activities, but most of them are, most of them are mainly focusing consumer needs, right? Uh, as I said, there you, you do have some interesting presence of uh, more sophisticated activities. Uh, also, uh, they there, there is an interesting adaptation capacity, right? Many unicorns are, as I said before, filling the gaps created by the institutional voice existing in these countries, right? Like uh, as the example that I gave with mobile painting, uh, payment and fintech, right? Given that the bancarization in, the, in many emerging markets, uh, it, it's really low, then fintech appears a solution to solve this, right? Uh, you have a, 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 a less intense uh, degree of venture capital activity, right? You have more state intervention in terms of state funding. Uh, I'm not saying that there is no VC. Actually, in Asia, it's quite large compared to the other regions, but it came later, right? Uh, overall, in emerging markets, VCs uh, came later uh, than, of course, what happened in, in, in advanced economy. Here's just to give you a uh, perspective. Uh, in, two, um, in the 20, uh, 2017 to 2021 period uh, in Latin America, there were about 1,250 projects funded by VCs, while in uh, Asia, there were about 37,000. That tells you a little bit about the size uh, of, 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 and the importance of venture capital in Asia compared to other uh, emerging market regions, right? Uh, and that also explains why you have way more unicorns in, uh, in Asia than what you would ha have in, um, in, uh, in Africa or in Latin America, okay? Um, another interesting thing is that many unicorns expand abroad, right? It's, it's, uh, they, they internationalize, right? But the way they, they internationalize, it's interesting, right? Or at least to me, it's interesting. Uh, first of all, there are a few cases of born global companies. That means companies that uh, are created thinking in a global market. So when they were created, they are not just thinking in their local market. They, they from, from their initial stages, 
start selling uh, their product or services abroad, right? You do have a few cases like that, but what you find uh, it's more like um, a regional focus, right? Companies that start in one country and then spread all around the region, right? They don't, I, and they have slowly or, I mean, they haven't moved that much towards uh, beyond their own region, right? They have expanded heavily in their own region, but not that much beyond that. You don't have that many cases of, of course there are exceptions, but overall, you don't have that many cases of companies becoming, uh, going to advanced economies and becoming real global leaders, okay? Uh, and another interesting that, thing that could have happened, but it didn't, is that you have, you don't have that much South-South investment, right? That means, well, South-South is more uh, uh, like, okay, like a Latin American company going to Africa, right? Like going, instead of going to North, it will go, you know, uh, South-South, right? Or, or Southeast Asia for that matter, right? Uh, you don't have that much of that. They are concentrated in their own region mainly. Um, so um, I think I'm running out of time, right, John? Um, yeah, you're, you're about out of time. You could wrap up, you have one minute. Yeah, I have one minute. I'll just, I, I won't be able to give you like the, the theoretical uh, perspective. I just wanted to tell you that this is a very uh, interesting topic. And we are working with a group of uh, scholars, you know, uh, on a book about unicorns from emerging markets. Um, we have the fortune that John and, and James are going to be participating on the book. Uh, and um, anyway, this would be the, the second of a, of a book series that we we have done with the emerging multi, multi uh, sorry emerging multinational research network. Uh, but anyway, I. I Hopefully, at some other time, I, I could give you the, the theoretical framework that we, we think to apply, we hope to apply to understand this uh, uh, the race of unicorns in emerging markets. Thank you very much for your attention, and I apologize if I extended no, it too much. You did great. Thank you so much, Diego, for your presentation, which we are going to share with the audience upon request. We next turn to uh, Professor Dr. Sri Adiningshi, and the floor is yours, madam. Uh, please, uh, and let me know if you want us to run your PowerPoint or if you want to do it yourself, we're at your disposal. I would share myself. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, John, and also ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here this morning time in Indonesia and live uh, evening, yeah, for you and all, of, and also maybe some afternoon, yeah. Uh, but it's really my pleasure to be here to join with this interesting webinar. And thanks, Diego. It's really insightful information. And I would love to share with all of you about uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, indeed. Okay. Okay. I would, okay. Yeah. Uh, would share about Indonesian digital startup ecosystem, uh, as has been mentioned by uh, Diego, yeah, that uh, of course the startup unicorn development would be influenced by, uh, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, in general, I believe that it wouldn't be homogeneous because each country has different needs, yeah, and also. Uh, culture, social, and in Indonesia, uh, you know that we are between Australia and here Philippines, Malay, and we are the biggest uh, actually archipelagic country yeah, with uh, island more than 16,000 and actually uh, with population more than 270 million. So, you know, of course, the startup a unicorn which developed in Indonesia uh, to fit what Indonesia need, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, aside that, that Indonesia is not homogeneous because between Western part and Eastern part, actually we have totally, and even Java, outside Java, totally different, uh, I mean, like development, yeah. There is uh, high-end equality, yeah, between Java or Java and between 
western part Indonesia and eastern part of Indonesia. Western Java usually more advanced, higher human resource quality, more advanced economy, and yeah, in general level of welfare uh, it's better, yeah, compared to outside of Java and especially uh, in eastern part of Indonesia. And of course, you know, uh, because that characteristic, uh, digitalization and disruption uh, is interesting, yeah, uh, and attract a lot of first actually business person who interested in, uh, you know, uh, using this uh, digitalization, yeah, uh, for their business purpose and also society because the characteristic, yeah, because. And that's why uh, digitalization with give a lot of, uh, you know, benefit, especially uh, one thing is really in Indonesia, like uh, flexibility, yeah, because, uh, you know, with flexibility and time and places you can work, sell, uh, and do something, I mean, uh, no need to be in city, in Java, uh, because it's, uh, you know, it's really big in Indonesia, yeah. And that's why it's really attract a lot of Indonesian people, yeah. Especially, of course, the first uh, in the city, yeah, and the uh, have in Indonesia and the uh, higher human resource uh, quality in Indonesia. And then uh, finally, uh, also spread up, yeah, uh, all over Indonesia, not just in big city, but also in in small city, even in rural areas, starting yeah, digital transformation. I would love to uh, share with all of you that sort of Indonesian digital development. Uh, actually, you know, digitalization in Indonesia just started around uh, yeah, ten more than a decade ago. Yeah, like buka, uh, like Tokopedia, uh, I mean, and also Gojek. I mean, the unicorn, with famous unicorn in Indonesia just started in 2009, but they really in the market 2010, yeah. Uh, and then also, you know, uh, the startup in Indonesia is, you, uh, is concentrated mostly in Jakarta areas, but then also Bandung, big city, yeah, and have a lot of university and also even in Yogyakarta, and then also uh, start, start up to Indonesia. Yeah. And most of the uh, startup in Indonesia actually um, micro, yeah, micro business, and even like digital banking really developed fast yeah, in just last year because of the pandemic. Finally, you know, digitalization in Indonesia actually developed so fast. That's why uh, Indonesia, yeah, uh, becoming. Uh, one of top 10 countries by number of startup, yeah. Uh, and yes, it's developed us even before the pandemic, actually almost 20% grew, but uh, actually during pandemic, yeah, uh, uh, really growing really fast, yeah. And in Indonesia right now, we have at least, yeah, to Kakon and to unicorn and still even during pandemic still uh, funding come to Indonesia uh, and uh, actually I would love to share with all of you uh, like has been mentioned by Diego that uh, you know in developing country emerging economy uh, not the same like it's fund economy in developing startup and unicorn and in Indonesia actually uh, yes e-commerce uh, develop us. But then right hailing, yeah, because a lot of connectivity problem in Indonesia and traveling, yeah. Uh, even if you come to Indonesia, go food, yeah, uh, food delivery, go food, grab food is becoming very famous you now. Almost, uh, if you ask my people, Ahmad Kamal, usually a lot, uh, many of us usually uh, order food using grab food or go food. And yes, that's also makes, you know, uh, it's quite different with uh, the other country. Yeah. 
But anyway, uh, also in Indonesia, there are many Sun, Sunicorn companies, yeah, uh, would be, uh, hopefully would be, and they uh, soon become unicorn. And uh, uh, so what is interesting in that finally government uh, preparing Merah Putih Fund to strengthen startup yeah, ecosystem in Indonesia, uh, it's still, I mean, it's still just started. So uh, I haven't really know yet uh, the progress under no Let's just take a look at the digital uh, ecosystem in Indonesia. Indonesia actually uh, the uh, uh, population um, majority actually uh, young, yeah, young, uh, young, uh, young generation, millennial X, baby, uh, millennial Z, uh, post Z. I mean, uh, you know, and uh, that's uh, of course if we take a look the young uh, usually you know young population is dominant and they are digital savvy yeah, because they are digital uh, digital native for me like myself as well as digital uh, immigrant yeah. and internet access develop better and covered broader even still limited yeah, if compared to any other country and also digital divide also from, uh, if we take a look between urban and rural area, uh, internet user. I mean, in, in India, digital divide is really, uh, you know, a serious problem. Even like electricity, not all Indonesian has electricity access, but it's getting better. But coverage signal, just take a look uh, where you know that internet speed in Indonesia is slow, yeah, compared to any other country, yeah. Uh, and literacy uh, is okay, but uh, so uh, you know, uh, between um, also younger generation, uh, more literate compared to uh, the older generation. Yeah, but despite all the problem we are facing, yeah. Indonesia is in brick or soon. Yeah? Uh, we are start a little bit compared to a far country, uh, left behind, but we are growing fast. Yeah? That's where we are. And also, Indonesia are the digital life leader. I mean, because in Indonesia, actually, uh, digital is welcome by Indonesian people. Yeah? And they are not refused of. Uh, they think positive of digitalization, yeah, and even during pandemic, yeah, in this uptake of digital technologies, yeah, because they are considered as positive, uh, benefit, uh, benefit, okay, benefit, and uh, some, uh, you know, uh, of course, if we take a look, uh, like firm, uh, the one large firm usually have better human resource, uh, higher in uptake of digital technology compared to micro firm. Yeah? Uh, and also, like I has mentioned before, because there is uh, even uh, infrastructure uh, between and also human resource uh, among uh, between uh, state in Indonesia, uh, heterogen, and there is some defect, and also uh, the e-commerce uh, to, to, uh, so are you e-commerce uh, development in Indonesia, like in Jakarta, 42 percent has been joined e-commerce, but like if it took a look, like here, Papua, is less than 20 percent. Anyway, that's it, Indonesia. And of course, if we are talking like uh, safety, yeah, uh, online transactions, uh, transaction safety is still problem in Indonesia. Uh, even you know, uh, even like e-commerce and also uh, ride hailing and travel. I mean, you know, uh, developers in Indonesia and also e-commerce. But uh, adoption of digital financial services is still uh, low, yeah, because they are consider a lot of Indonesian consider is not safe. That's why. Uh, actually, I don't know whether it has happened in other countries. 50% actually 
e-commerce transaction and online using COD, uh, cash on delivery. So when the stuff I order come to my home, then I pay. I mean, so, but just like uh, usual transaction, but order online, then payment would be uh, done when the stuff uh, has been uh, uh, arrived. Yeah. And of course, government authorities regulation support uh, like information and electronic transactions. So that that's the, the most important use electric transaction becoming legally at least supported. Yeah, and of course, also personal data protection access. Uh, just last month has been uh, you know active in Indonesia and also. Mm, a lot of line minister and offices, finance minister, minister of trade, transportation, and even this morning I read that in Indonesia, like uh, authority would like, uh, you know, uh, open up like a crypto exchange. Yeah, I mean, and also uh, Bank Indonesia, the central bank, financial service authority. A lot of you know policies has been taken to support the development of you know uh, digital uh, digitalization yeah, development in Indonesia yeah, and even uh, Ministry of uh, Kominfo yeah uh, have Indonesia digital develop Indonesian digital roadmap. Yeah. I mean just to show with all of you that the government and all authorities support. Uh, the development of uh, digital transformation, digital economy transformation, uh, also local government, but of course, uh, still limited. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 in central, usually they have already, uh, you know, uh, have uh, really supported uh, well, but in local government, some local government do not really uh, has the ability to, and also. Uh, support the development of uh, digitalization and formation in Indonesia. And this also would love to share with all of you, like uh, how, how serious is the government like digital talent. Scholarship by go also prepare human resource digital talent, yeah. Uh, also digital literacy national movement, uh, has been you know in Indonesia, and not just uh, I mean line minister, but also uh, in Indonesia, uh, state-owned enterprises uh, like develop startup incubator and accelerator, accelerator, yeah, uh, and also university. Uh, I believe that Pak Ahmad Gamal would uh, share with all of us about universitas Indonesia. And I, in my university, in Universitas Gajah Mada, we also have actually UGM Innovative Academy yeah, to support the start development of staff art in Indonesia in UGM Science Technology. And also government, of course, uh, local government like Bandung, Technopark, yeah, and private, I mean, a lot of private also join. Uh, to this incubator and accelerator in Indonesia. And of course, uh, foreign investor is uh, very important in uh, Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, compared to Asia, look, uh, uh, actually quite, yeah, like funded quite many, and also uh, in Indonesia. Take a look here, finance, insurance, yeah, uh, and transportation, logistic, uh, so you know, uh, and travel, tourism, yeah. I mean, number of unicorn compared to any other countries, yeah. Uh, in ASEAN, actually, Indonesia, you know, like I has mentioned before, that uh, some uh, unicorn more developed, I mean, in Indonesia, uh, and startup. And then the other uh, area, sector, yeah. And source of unicorn in ASEAN, actually, uh, you know, there are home crowd, spin off, and also not your foreign unicorn. I mean, like in Indonesia, GTID, yeah. 
uh, but uh, homegrown like Goto, yeah, Gojek and Tokopedia uh, and spin off, yeah, and like Blibli, Ticket.com and anyway, uh, you know, like crypto and uh, AR are uh, top use metaverse text in Southeast Asia to stick a look in Indonesia, virtual world, yeah. Also develop this ID, yes, as people, yeah. And often there's some challenge, opportunity and future, yeah. I mean, like I has mentioned before, yeah, that uh, in Indonesia, the ecosystem is getting better, is supported, but of course there is some limitation, yeah. But one thing that uh, we are sure, and this also some has been conducted in Indonesia, yeah, uh, the survey online will stick around after the pandemic, because convenient, flexible, efficient, and productive, more choices, yeah. And uh, if you take a look, actually, uh, because, you know, uh, people believe, yeah, in Indonesia that uh, digitalization contribute to more innovative and new job, yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, virtual economy metaphors also started in Indonesia, still in its early development, but it's moving, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we take a look like some data, Indonesia, uh, economic digital, yeah, uh, internet economic growing would be uh, from in 10 years, yeah, would be five times, oh. which is really interesting. And of course, that would disrupt, it, disrupt the job market. And that's why a lot of university and also uh, education institution working hard for it because, uh, you know, the disruption and also uh, the gig economy, uh, which develop, also develop us in Indonesia, need support from a lot of institutions. And we are talking and also thinking how the best way uh, that transformation did not, uh, you know, uh, disrupt uh, the economy and people life, yeah, because uh, we are in digital competitiveness, we are not that high, so it's very, very hard for us to be compete uh, in this digital era. And of course, if we are not uh, careful, anticipated, uh, the development of digitalization could worsen economic inequality. And in Indonesia, we still have uh, economic inequality uh, seriously, no? so it worsen, would be some serious problem for the country. And actually, digitalization uh, would be able to increase economic growth based on and this study, yeah, like one percentage point economic growth as we invest more in digital uh, and also, uh, you know, some talents like most Indonesia, actually, uh, education, uh, uh, mostly uh, education from junior school lower than junior school, so it's a big challenge, yeah. Uh, but actually, if we invest more on people, there is potential that the GDP growth uh, would be higher and also share of uh, skilling is really high, yeah. Uh, and we still have digital training gap in Indonesia. A serious problem uh, and need a lot of digital skill and the conclusions. My last yeah, uh, slide, Indonesia as the biggest RC archipelago country face problem in developing this nation. Yeah. Digital economy develops in Indonesia because great opportunity and of course flexible. Yeah. Digital ecosystem support digital economic transformation. Even there is still some problem, but it's getting better compared to 10 years ago. Yeah. Digital economy which developed faster during pandemic will still grow even face challenges uh, because uh, especially the biggest is digital divide and will go, will go to virtual uh, started now. Digital is, uh, I mean, even some years, yeah. Digitalization potentially accelerate development and prosperity for all because flexible in time and places, uh, and it is uh, really important, especially in archipelago country like Indonesia. Authorities, stakeholder, uh, now I mean in general, we are working hard to develop supported uh, ecosystem and human at the center to be successful in digital 
transformation. Cooperation, collaboration is important in developing digital virtual transformation to reap the opportunity. I think that's what would I would love to share with all of you. Hopefully, it would be useful. Thank you, Dr. Shri. Can you hear me? For you know, can be uh, yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shri, for an incredibly dense and rich presentation. Uh, I can see that uh, we have benefited from your uh, activities as chairperson of the Presidential Advisory Council of the Republic of Indonesia. This is so, such a rich uh, PowerPoint that I think we'll need a little bit of time to digest the information you have conveyed to us. We express our gratefulness and thankfulness for sharing that information with us, which will be made available to audience attendees. Thank you so much. We're next going to move to a colleague of yours. Jim, are you ready? Uh, Dr. Ahmad Gamal, and here he is. Good evening for you uh, in the US and good morning for you uh, in Asia or somewhere uh, in Australia. Um, thank you very much to John McIntyre and James Odley, um, who has invited me to this wonderful panel. Um, I'm going to present um, my lessons learned about how we nurture entrepreneurship uh, and what we can learn from the rise of Southeast Asian unicorn. Uh, for those uh, who uh, just meet me uh, for the first time uh, in this evening, uh, my name is Gamal. I direct the Office of Innovation and Science Techno Park here at Universitas Indonesia. Um, so let me first begin by um, discussing who uh, they really are. Um, and this is a quick look of Southeast Asian unicorns uh, and their uh, respective uh, value uh, and size. Uh, to begin with, uh, my presentation is to discuss why uh, Asia and uh, in this particular event uh, Southeast Asia matters. If you look at venture capital deals in ASEAN between 2010 and 2022, you will find a, a consistent and constant increase of deals being made as well as aggregate deal value uh, uh, being made. Um, the only exception to this is, you know, 2020, uh, right after the pandemic hits. Uh, but, you know, other than that, uh, you will see a consistent and uh, constant increase of either the number of deals uh, as well as the total value of these deals. And these figures exclude add-ons, grants, mergers, secondary stock purchases, and venture debt. So really, this is the money that venture capitalists pour um, into startups in Southeast Asia um, within 12 years. Um, before the pandemic, you can see that Singapore actually uh, dominates in terms of you know, billions of dollars that has been uh, put uh, into startups. But after the pandemic, um, between 2020 and 2021, you will see that the share of uh, startup fundraising deals in Southeast Asia uh, goes more to Indonesia, actually almost half of them, uh, or to be exact, 45.8% uh, goes to Indonesian startups, whereas about one third um, raising goes to Singaporean Asia, startups, and the rest uh, is distributed more to among Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, Philippines, uh, and Vietnam. Uh, so if you look at before and after the pandemic, uh, in 2018, we saw the rise of 10 unicorns, uh, and about five of them uh, were in Singapore, and another five were uh, in Indonesia. Uh, and you see some of uh, you know, bigger startups, uh, the group of 100 million plus um, uh, companies uh, that are located in either Vietnam or, or the Philippines. Uh, and nowadays, the number is definitely more than double. It actually almost quadrupled. Uh, so today, uh, we see 39 unicorns uh, in Southeast Asia, and most of them are either in Indonesia or in Singapore. Uh, with some notable exceptions uh, in Vietnam, Philippines, uh, and Malaysia as well. So uh, really, if we really want to learn um, what they actually do, um, before the pandemic hits, uh, there were mainly three industries in which they operate. 
Um, the biggest players were doing ride hailings. Uh, Grab and Gojek uh, at one point were competitors uh, in Indonesia. Uh, Grab is actually a Singaporean company uh, and they do both ride hailing and payments. And then the next big thing was basically um, online shopping, e-commerce, with uh, Lazada being the largest player, Tokopedia coming next, uh, and um, Bukalapak as uh, the next big thing in Indonesia. Uh, and third, uh, which was really surprising to me as well, uh, was that gaming was a big thing for a Southeast uh, Asian market. Uh, C um, in Singapore uh, was basically the biggest player in gaming industry, uh, but it also does payments and e-commerce as well. Uh, but if you look at Razer, for example, Razer uh, focuses on gaming hardwares, uh, whereas VNG does a combination of gaming and social media. Um, of course, uh, there is Revolution Precrafted, which is a Philippine company that does the niche market of sort of a uh, customized real estate, uh, customized housing uh, for the Filipino market. Uh, but other than that, you will see that, um, you know, all players uh, exist within the three sectors, ride hailing, uh, payments and e-commerce uh, and gaming. If you look at the data after 2021, uh, there is definitely more diverse areas in which uh, Southeast Asian unicorns operate. Um, the biggest uh, valued uh, startup nowadays in Southeast Asia is Goto, which is uh, the result of the merger between Gojek and Tokopedia. Gojek did ride hailing. Uh, Gojek did and does ride hailing uh, and payments. Uh, Tokopedia uh, did and does um, uh, e-commerce uh, as well as payments as well. Um, and when they're combined, uh, it's interesting because uh, they're identifying themselves as uh, the players within the on-demand industry. So. Uh, the combination of ride hailing and uh, e-commerce now merge into uh, something that is well known in the industry as an on-demand industry instead of just uh, a separate e-commerce and uh, um, uh, ride hailing uh, industry. We, we also saw the rise of auto and transportation industry. Um, we still see e-commerce and gaming as sort of um, the big players uh, in the startup industry, but we also saw uh, the rise of financial technology companies, and uh, we saw some uh, supply chain, logistics, and courier services uh, as being uh, the next big things uh, in the list of unicorns in Southeast Asia. Um, if, you know, we want to learn about uh, the emerging industries, then you really have to pay attention to uh, the recent unicorns in Southeast Asia. Uh, in 2021, uh, we saw a list of almost uh, 15 new startups uh, that is joining the group of new unicorns. And um, really, we can just look at the kind of industries that they um, uh, operate in to learn about the emerging uh, sectors uh, in Southeast Asia nowadays. So two of them actually um, do business in the used car marketplace. Uh, and about three of them actually does e-commerce logistics. So there is a lot of logistics and courier servicing uh, companies that um, are uh, coming uh, and really the three winners uh, in this market is JNT Express, Ninja Van and Flash Express. But these are local or should I say regional players though. So JNT Express um, does Indonesian market. Uh, Ninja Van does um, uh, a Southeast Asia market. Uh, Flash Express does a uh, Thai market. Uh, and if you really pay attention, uh, you know, the previous example with uh, Carson Group and Caro as well, um, really Carson Group uh, originates from Malaysia, but it also does the Indonesian market. And Caro is a Singaporean company, but it also does Indonesian market. So aside of Indonesia, it seems to me that uh, these companies started uh, locally, but then it started uh, to uh, try to reach the uh, Indonesian market uh, because they really can't ignore the fact that Indonesia has such a large population uh, and that large population translates to also a large digital population as well and that is really the potential market for them and uh, to a certain extent I think um, Zendit, uh, Advanced Intelligence, Fulltech, Finexel, Metrix, Sport and Neon 
uh, really you can categorize all of these companies as sort of doing some financial technology. Uh, and that is probably something that has a lot of potential to explore. So if you really want to look at uh, what enables this proliferation of new startups uh, reaching the unicorn status in Southeast Asia, um, at least I can point out two things. One is, uh, you know, given that ASEAN has uh, six countries that with a very significant uh, population, and that translates to, uh, you know, having also a significant amount of digital population. Indonesia has 265 million people uh, as of 2018, uh, with 132 million um, at least uh, internet users, and at least 130 million social media users. And these are very noisy social media users. Uh, they really, really uh, often post. Uh, they're very chatty uh, on Twitter, uh, on Instagram. Uh, so they're very active uh, in uh, doing social media. Uh, Malaysia only has 31 million, but that translates into 25 million of internet users. Philippines has 105 million, uh, but that translates into 67 million of internet users and so on and so forth, right? So in total, what I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of people in Southeast Asia, and fortunately, uh, they're not just people who are not um, advanced users of the internet, advanced users and chatty users of the social media. Uh, they're, they're actually very active. They're actually very present uh, in the virtual world, uh, in the internet. And this really uh, fuels the growth of um, internet-based uh, technology startups. The next thing that I would like to mention is that if you look at fundraising by venture capitalists with specific interest in Southeast Asia, you will see a significant rise. So by 2019, um, this is the latest data that uh, I can have, um, in total, there was at least 2.6 trillion million, uh, 2.6 trillion U.S. dollars that is being um, a channel to um, uh, uh, startups in Southeast Asia by venture capitals. Uh, and if you look at the list, you know, for example, if I just look at some of the names that I'm very familiar with, Kajora Interfest, Berry Ventures, East Ventures, Intuito Ventures, these are uh, venture capitals that operate specifically. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, but they also have a uh, specific interest in Southeast Asia. So you see not just the number of uh, venture capitals uh, actually spending money and uh, channeling those monies into Southeast Asian uh, ventures, but you see the uh, birth of new venture capital uh, as well in Southeast Asia. So you see um, you know, uh, the doubling of uh, fundraisers uh, by venture capitalists uh, in Southeast Asia through these two channels, right? So um, really, what are the lessons that we can learn um, from the rise of uh, Southeast Asian ventures? Um, I think at least there are three lessons. One is, uh, if I may say, uh, that real market really comes first and capital market will follow. Uh, before the pandemic, we saw that um, a lot of the uh, companies in Singapore rises to the unicorn status much faster than Indonesian companies. And I think this is due to uh, you know, how mature the Singaporean capital market is, uh, and that mature ecosystem plays uh, a very significant role uh, in the proliferation of startups reaching the uh, unicorn status in Singapore. But after the pandemic, uh, really the digital population, the number of people uh, that is very internet savvy, uh, very attached to social media, very chatty in the social media realms, uh, really, this translates into the number of market that can be targeted by um, uh, Indonesian startups uh, and Southeast Asian uh, uh, startups as well. And this really translates into the number of unicorns <clears throat> that uh, has proliferated um, you know, after 2019. And this really explains how Indonesian startups can catch up with their uh, Singaporean counterparts. So the second lesson that I think we can learn is that you know, there is sort of this um, uh, a debate between whether you really need real innovation uh, or uh, incremental innovation um, uh, is actually sufficient for you to um, rise into sort of the unicorn status, right? If you look at uh, the early Southeast Asian unicorns, uh, the original 10, uh, these were technology-based disruptors to the market, right? They did ride hailing, they did online shopping, they did, uh, you know, a gaming industry, uh, they really did something that um, 
at least the Southeast Asian market never saw before, uh, even though that was probably done somewhere else uh, in uh, the Americas or in Europe, right? But in Southeast Asia, that was something that was relatively new. Uh, but later unicorns really just focus on using technology to improve the less or uh, dare I say, uh, inefficient business processes. So um, uh, unicorns in supply chain technology, for example, uh, some unicorns that does e-commerce but really play with a niche market, for example, with used clothing, that's a very niche market. Uh, or um, uh, uh, startups that does uh, you know, travel booking, you know, that's not something new, but that is something that uh, can be done uh, in a more efficient way if you're doing it online, rather than actually going to a, a physical uh, travel agent. So even though these are not new businesses, but these are businesses that are relatively much more efficient than their uh, uh, brick and mortar kind of store version. Uh, and these later unicorns uh, uh, actually uh, rises to the status of unicorns by focusing on using technology to improve the less or um, the inefficient business processes. And if you really look at the list of unicorns, they really are sector agnostic, right? Because technology improves businesses in many different industries. Uh, and I should say that I think at this point, the barrier to entry is not really defined by the company's technological prowess. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the early uh, Southeast Asian unicorns were technology-based disruptors. But the later unicorns really just, um, you know, did something with uh, you know, making more efficient business processes. So really, there isn't there isn't that much um, technological prowess, if I may say, uh, that would really fuel uh, their rise to the unicorn status. Uh, I think it's important to pay attention to how they can make capital available, uh, because uh, with uh, you know, with no real innovation, if I may say that. Uh, what you really can do, what you really must do is to eliminate early competitors. And to eliminate early competitors, you have to burn a lot of cash. You have to have capital available. Uh, and you have to have capital available in the right time uh, with the right strategy uh, to basically win competition, right? Uh, so what then? Uh, and this is really a reflection of how our business incubator here at the University of Indonesia um, a deal with our startups. And uh, I think to a certain extent, this is something that we can learn together uh, on how business incubators should treat new startups. Uh, to give a little credential on uh, why we're doing this reflection, uh, since 2015, we have incubated around 121 startups. Uh, and some of our startups uh, are not yet unicorns, but uh, they're somewhat in the range of 100 million plus. Flip, for example, uh, Flip uh, is a financial technology company that was way before um, uh, you know, the Indonesian government creates mechanisms to make um, transfer uh, among uh, banks uh, to be uh, less costly. Uh, they were actually uh, sort of the real inventors behind um, frictionless and costless uh, transfer among uh, Indonesian banks. Uh, so a lot of other industries in different sectors, if ever, for example, uh, is a catering company that uh, strives to be uh, the Indonesian uh, e-commerce uh, for catering services. Uh, Geofast, for example, is one of our um, startups that does uh, sustainable and um, quick uh, 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 building material, uh, which is a real alternative to uh, cement. Um, and, you know, other startups uh, that does uh, many interesting things um, that was incubated by our business incubators. And really, our model is innovate first and incubate later. Uh, we really try not to uh, solicit um, uh, proposals uh, for uh, a business incubation before we are certain that they actually have something that can be uh, protected by um, intellectual property rights protection. Uh, so um, we started with sort of an ideation process uh, and we provide uh, seed fundings for research and development. And we want to make sure that as a result of that uh, R&D, uh, there is something that can be protected uh, and can be valued. Uh, and that is something that, um, you know, has a technological value. And we do some sort of an assessment uh, if, uh, you know, uh, the product or the services that is being uh, proposed by our researchers and our students is something that has sort of a low market risk, but really needs, you know, uh, intensive 
uh, capital uh, to produce, then we would choose to just license them uh, to existing uh, and uh, more established industrial partners. But if they have a high market risk, uh, but they're less capital intensive, this might be something that we can incubate. This might be something that, you know, as part of a strategy, uh, is something that uh, we can introduce as sort of a startup that can be our next um, industry partners uh, to the university's R&D. So by sort of combining this with some market pool strategies by constantly asking our industry partners and our startup um, uh, partners, uh, you know, what do, what do you actually need? Uh, what kind of products do you need? Um, we sort of, uh, we sort of um, go back and forth between uh, us as sort of a research office, a, a technology transfer office, and sort of the office that would facilitate relationship with businesses and industry, and to a certain extent, um, you know, give birth to the new startups uh, in the industry as well. We go back and forth between these three roles. Um, and that's not easy, right? Because uh, that means we have to cater to um, a very different need from, you know, uh, different startups that would come to us uh, and, you know, ask for our help uh, for an incubation. So uh, once we receive a proposal from them, uh, we go through a selection process and each startup needs to go through a particular bootcamp uh, where we give them with, uh, you know, startup 101s, uh, business model canvases, uh, intellectual property rights protection workshops, uh, and a certain workshop uh, on how they can build a great team. Uh, but really, you, we have to pay attention to where uh, these people uh, are actually at. Some people are actually you know, yeah, just asking the right questions uh, and really the kind of support that we uh, have to provide to them is to help them to think about how to validate the problem and how to validate the solution. Uh, and, you know, we would, you know, box them uh, with other people who are asking the same right questions, right? So uh, we call that sort of a problem and solution fit program or scheme. Uh, but some other people are, you know, more technologically uh, engineering driven, technologically inclined. Uh, so they're kind of the right people uh, to basically do product development and the, really the support that we need to provide uh, is to uh, help them do validation for their product, do validation for their market and uh, do validation of their business models, right? Uh, so we would basically provide a product market fit programs for these kinds of people. And some other people actually probably um, are pretty established in uh, their technology, pretty established in uh, their product and their uh, innovation uh, and they have sort of a well-defined services that they want to provide uh, for the market uh, so really what we need to provide uh, for them is kind of a scale-up program that would provide them with um, you know knowledge of uh, sort of the legal aspects of establishing a startup how to do financial management how to do you know growth hacking um, sort of the strategy to market their products and to a certain extent when they're uh, you know ready to do that uh, how to do fundraising. So uh, really that's the things that um, I think I have learned from looking at Southeast Asian unicorns uh, and some of the stuff that I think we can uh, learn together. Um, and hopefully, you know, by uh, looking at Southeast Asian unicorn and listening to my presentation, um, you know, you can also um, gain something from this short presentation as well. So thank you for your attention, uh, and I will return the session uh, to John and James. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gamal, for an excellent presentation, insightful. So we have had three very good presentations. Uh, we have had a first presentation by our colleague from Argentina, who has provided an overview of uh, uh, unicorns and the entrepreneurship pr process in emerging markets. Then we have had the view from the inside provided by Dr. Shri with the benefit of her many years as a presidential advisor and an incredible presentation that will take a while to digest. And then uh, a very insightful presentation from the field from a, an academic who is also a technology incubator. And uh, so we've come to the end of uh, our first presentation. We have a short few minutes left for a question or two which I will raise with Diego, whom I see here on my screen. Uh, we will, uh, at this point, make available Stephen's presentation on the video, 
which will be made available to all of, all of the audience members in the end, interest of making sure we stay on track and on time and give the full attention to the second part, which has uh, four or five speakers. I have a question directing it directly at Diego on the basis of your experience and expertise. You mentioned uh, the role of unicorns and rising startups in filling gaps and solving market failures. But is that a substitute for the role of government in providing needed services and funding where there is such a gap and such a market failure? Can unicorns be viewed as a substitute legitimately, economically, politically? Well, it's a very interesting question. And <clears throat> ideally, they shouldn't be substitutes, but complement, complement, uh, they should be complementers, right? They should complement with the with what the government is trying to, to, to do. But they appear mm -hmm. in places where, where the government has failed to, to provide, to fill the gaps, right? So, and that may be helpful for the government, right? Um, I mean, there should, for instance, there shouldn't be so uh, uh, such large levels of informality, right? Uh, and the government have failed. The governments uh, in in many emerging markets have failed uh, in their in their quest to include uh, uh, these uh, informal workers into a more formal system, right? Um, so in that sense, I wouldn't feel it as a competition. They should be complementary. But it is it is true that they wouldn't exist. I mean, if the government had had been able to solve this issue, I don't know if I had answered this but, right. But I'm trying this, to yeah. make it sure because I know we are running out of time. We are running out of time. Yeah. So. But uh, so you do not view unicorns as a substitute for proper government policy involvement and uh, provisions through a budget process. No, no, not directly, right? I mean, informality is still going to be there. And I'm, I'm just thinking on, on fintech just as an example, because it's a very emblematic example. I mean, what they, what, what uh, this system is doing is aiding and helping these informal workers uh, to have some more financial tools, right? But it's not eliminating the, the, the informal workers, right? They, they, they are not being transfers transfer into a more formal uh, environment, which is what I guess most societies, societies desire. Thank you. That's a complex question, obviously, uh, one that we will be debating. We look forward to participating in your book. That will be one of the leading books in the field. And there's a lot of work to be done ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panel participants. We have reached the end of our presentation for panel number one, the academic theoretical panel. I thank all of the participants. Uh, I want to restate that Stephen's presentation will be included in the video in its entirety. If you have questions directed at uh, Dr. Shri, at Gamal, uh, at Stephen, or at Diego, please uh, put them directly in the chat room or in the questions and answers, and we will make sure they get them. We are next moving to the second panel that will be directed by my colleague from the University of San Francisco, Roger Chen. Thank you so much. Wishing you a good trip, uh, Diego. Hi, everyone. This is Stephen. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship in University of Adelaide in Australia. And I'm very happy to be here today with you on such an important conference. I really appreciate the organizers of organizing this conference because the topic of unicorn and innovation in Southeast Asia is very relevant and it's uh, such an emerging topic that uh, we really want to discuss and understand you know, further. <clears throat> So uh, before I start, um, I'll just briefly mention three points, you know, uh, why I might be relevant on speaking on such a topic. So first of all, uh, nationality wise, um, I'm from Southeast Asia and my nationality is Singaporean. <clears throat> and also I have been to, you know, many Southeast Asian countries. In fact, I have been to all the Southeast Asian countries, except for two tiny nations of Brunei and East Timor. 
And I've been to like Malaysia and Indonesia, you know, those countries for more than 10 times. So I do know a little bit about the region. <clears throat> and lastly, as an academic, my research area and my teaching area is entrepreneurship. And one of my recent papers in Journal of Management Studies is actually just on the topic of uh, firm growth, how to grow a firm in terms of, you know, aligning the top management team. And today I'll, I'll give a, a half practitioner and half research, you know, uh, an evidence-based talk. <clears throat> so the, the key thing <clears throat> is really about, you know, how to create a unicorn company. So first of all, to become a unicorn company, to become a unicorn startup, um, there must be two things that happen. <clears throat> One is that the unicorn startup needs to create value. And the second is that, you know, the unicorn needs to capture certain of the value. So it's, it may sound very intuitive, um, but as we, you know, discuss, we are going to realize a lot of time is much easier said than done. So the value creation part, <clears throat> that's really the innovation part. If a company doesn't innovate, it doesn't create a lot of value. It simply cannot grow very much. But also <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, a company may create a lot of values, but it may not actually be in the position to capture those values. So for example, right? Uh, so we are academics. So as a scientist, you know, we can create a lot of values. <clears throat> Albert Einstein creates a lot of value, but you know, like scientists most of the time are not in a position to capture most of the value they created. Take another business example. So one, you know, industry, I think you may know pretty well. So uh, Singapore has a very large, uh, you know, a hard drive industry. So the hard drive or the disk drive industry created a lot of values. Every single computer we use, you know, they have, you know, a, a sizable hard disk right now. But however, there's no major companies that are able to capture the values because companies in that industry are just very, very dynamic. They come in and they have very low margins and they turn out you know, very quickly. And that is the entrepreneurship or the strategy part you know, of the equation. So one is about creating value and the second one is about capturing value. So the question becomes, how do you capture value? Because we all know the basics, you know, uh, economics 101, we state that in perfect competition, marginal revenue equals to marginal cost. And then there's no profit. If there's no profit, you know, how do we, how, how does the company capture value? How does the company, you know, capture money to grow? <clears throat> in a perfect competitive, in a perfectly competitive world, that's what happens based on the economics 101. Every money you, you gain, a company gains, must be reinvested into the industry. That's the, that's the economical equilibrium. But in reality, that's not what happened. So I'm going to, you know, put some numbers here. The numbers might be a little updated, but it kind of shows them, you know, the, the, the picture of what really happens. So Microsoft has $52 billion in cash. Google has $40 billion in cash. Amazon has $10 billion in cash. And Apple has, you know, about $100 billion in cash and is growing in a very significant rate. So if there's market equilibrium, <clears throat> then why do these companies grow so much and have so much cash at hand? So if you think about the gross margin of this company, so gross margin is really like, you know, the, the amount of profit, you know, they get, um, you know, from every <clears throat> dollar of revenue in terms of percentages. So Apple's gross margin is about 40%. Google's is about 65% and Microsoft is, at 75%. <clears throat> and if you think about Amazon, which has 14%, but 14% is very, very high for a retailing company because in that industry, the average you know, gross margin is probably 2%. So why do these, man these companies gain so much money? Because as we said, in a perfect world, you know, the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. So what goes wrong? Because in a perfect world, the equilibrium happens. Where the equilibrium happens, 
is very efficient the market. But these companies, you know, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsoft, they are not living in a perfectly competitive world because of the innovation, right? So, so it's not really about being efficient because an efficient market, it might be good, you know, for all the players, for the consumers, but it's not necessarily for the companies because the company, they cannot retain the value. They cannot capture the value they are making. <clears throat> and innovation, the theme of the conference, which is one that breaks the e economic equilibrium. And because of that, if you think about all the unicorn startups, they do not set out to compete. It doesn't mean that, you know, they slack off. It, it doesn't mean that they don't work very hard. But what it means is that they're working on something which they don't have a lot of competition. They're working on something where they can capture most of the value without being to reinvest every single sense of that back to compete against other companies which are doing exactly the same thing. In other words, they are focusing on something which is not a zero sum game. So a zero sum game is something like, you know, if you gain, another person must lose. And that's, that's a deadlock competition. But all these innovative companies is not doing a zero sum game. They're creating something and that is that is a positive sum, and they're capturing the majority or the lion's share of that you know um you know big sum of the money by doing innovation. And then the equation becomes very different. So if you look at you know the technology S curve, some of you might be familiar with that. So for nascent industries, which are still experiencing a lot of innovation, being unique is very important, but you know the assets and resources for them is less important. But if you go to a mature industry where they have much less you know, uniqueness or novelty or innovation, but then they have a lot of complementary assets and resources. So this is where you want to be when you're creating a unicorn. And this is obviously you know, a very competitive you know, uh, zero sum game where you don't want to be if you're trying to launch you know, a, a unicorn startup. <clears throat> Maybe another example, you know, uh, which can help, you know, to illustrate is, you know, two kind of people, right? So we may have, um, you know, this, um, you know, easy example to deconomize, you know, two kind of uh, personas. So one is a nerd and the other one is athletes. So the engineers and the STEM people, the science, technology, and engineering people, they tend to be, you know, nerds, right? <clears throat> they are intelligent, they are problem solving, and these are naturally zero sum, you know, game people, right? Because they're always creating something and that by definition is new and hence it's not competitive. But athletes, on the other hand, they are highly motivated fighters. They compete, right? So if you think about, you know, the Olympic thing, there's going to be one, you know, one guy or one team who wins it all and they get, you know, the first prize, the gold medal. And then there's only one gold medal. So that's naturally a zero sum game. And they only win if the other guys lose. So sports or competitive sports is a classical example of zero sum training or zero sum game. So assuming everyone is competent. So if you have a lot of athletes type of people, then you're probably very good at competing. But if you have a lot of people who are who are nerdy people, then they tend to think about, you know, how do we things differently? And that is giving them this unfair advantage, you know, through innovation. So next I'll, I'll talk very briefly. Um, I know my time is running out, you know, the three steps, you know, to, um, to, to, to on how to create, you know, a unicorn startup. So the first thing is that, you know, um, to create a unicorn startup, you want to identify a new market. This is about, you know, the, the identifying, you know, or, you know, the, the value creation part. And then there's a value capturing part, you know, you take that market <clears throat> and then from there, you figure out, you know, how to expand, you know, over the adjacent markets. So how do you choose the right market? <clears throat> how do you, you know, find, you know, what is a good market? 
So the, the market which uh, <clears throat> which you want to choose, if you want to set out, you know, um, the goal of uh, doing a unicorn startup is that you don't want too small a market. That's not big enough. But also you don't want, you know, like a too big a market, you know, at onset because too big a market can be too hard to get a handle. It's just not easy for a startup, you know, to, to get a handle on them. And this is... Um, you know, finding the right market is not just a rhetorical exercise because a lot of people can, you know, talk about, you know, um, you know, the market to make it appear bigger or smaller. This is really about truth finding. This is about thinking very hard on whether the market you're dealing with is too big for you or too small for you. And the second important thing is the timing. When do you want to create the market? Sometimes, you know, like it's not, it's not the best to be the first to, to be in the market because if you are too early, you know, the market might not be ready. But also you can't be too late because if you're too late, there might not be enough room to do something. So generally, if you see all those unicorns, they are basically the last person who come to the field and then they make the last important improvements. It's like they come to they, they come into the room and then they close the door, right? So, so let me give you some example, right? So one example is the automotive industry back, you know, in the days, right? So this is about, you know, what happened in Detroit and, you know, the automotive industry, you know, a, a century ago. So if, even if you engineer, you're brilliant trying to build a car, an uh, automotive car, before the 19th century is probably a bad idea because the engine, the efficiency of the, of the engine just wasn't there, right? But if you're trying to build a traditional car company right now in 2022, that's obviously you know, not a very good idea either because that might be too late. If you think about all the car companies, you know, uh, the traditional car companies, there was about 300 of them. And most of them, they started, you know, like in the early part of the 20th century. And why is that timing important? Because that's when, you know, the technologies around the car are being created, not before and not after. And some, some other examples, if you think about Microsoft, right? So we all know like Microsoft is a great company in doing operating system. And it's probably the last company in doing, you know, that kind of uh, operation system. And Google is the last major search company in the sense that, you know, before Google, there were tons of different search companies, right? I, I remember search.com, you know, Atom Vista, et cetera, et cetera. They all came before Google, but Google was the search company which came to the picture and then they made a significant improvements you know, and that improvements is just, you know, not something which we have seen um, since, you know, Google has come to the picture, right? So th that's like the last important improvements. So it came to the Google search, sorry, it, it came to the, to the search engine, a deep bunch of improvements, and then people like, you know, we can't actually improve upon it too much further. But what about some other industries? What about say bioinformatics? Right, so that's hot. That's a very hot area. A lot of things seem to be happening, but it's very hard to know whether it is a time, you know, to jump into that industry for creating a unicorn startups, because the field is very promising, but we don't know whether we can see an improvement, which is like you know the last you know like uh, drawing up the bridge kind of improvements, right? So. The lesson is that, you know, if you want to build a company which is still around in 2040, you want to avoid a field that is moving too quickly because you may make some improvements, but others can make a lot of improvements after you. And then your company can't, you know, capture all the values. So you want to build a company and that company comes in and it's done a lot of improvements, obviously, you know, a lot of hard work, a lot of innovation and ingenuity and all that. But then they kind of, you know, like basically change, you know, the field so much that, you know, there's not a lot of radical innovation that can come after that, right? So 
obviously the incremental innovation, continuous improvements and all that, you know, afterwards, but then you want to set a company which kind of, you know, you know, does that, you know, the, the last major improvement. Um, and the step two and step three is really about, you know, how to take that market. So once you identify a market, you know, how do you take the market and how do you expand, you know, beyond that, right? Um, so I'll probably stop here because I think my time is running out, um, but I'm happy, you know, uh, to keep in contact. Should you have any questions or any things you want to discuss, this is my contact. I realize, you know, I'm sorry, I, I can't uh, really answer, you know, uh, you know, uh, do a QA and a session, you know, right now, you know, like, um, you know, virtually, but feel free to write me and I'm happy to discuss this important, you know, uh, topic with every one of you. Thank you very much.